That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about the United States versus Billy Holiday, a uh, return to narrative filmmaking for Lee Daniels, uh, which will be released uh, February 26, 2021, courtesy of uh, Hulu. Uh, prior to that, it was a, a very hot property at Paramount. The basic story. The basic. The basic the story. The real, the real truth, the real, real truth. That's from Death and the Maiden. Okay. The film opens in 1957 with Billie Holiday, who's played by Andre Day, mm -hmm. being interviewed by a report, like a journalist? Reginald Lord Devine is his name. Played by Leslie Jordan. Mm -hmm. And he is asking her a series of questions when he says, you know, what is it like being a colored woman? And... She sort of like reacts to that and then we get a flashback 10 years to 1947. Mm -hmm. And the film is basically recounting Holiday's journey from 1947 until she died in 1959 mm -hmm. at the age of 44 and her struggles with drug addiction mm -hmm. and the attack from the, from the FBI. Mm -hmm against her because of her singing the song or pop popularizing and performing the song Strange Fruit, which is about lynching. Right. Uh, but under the guise of uh, anti-drug laws, uh, the narcotics. So she was vehemently pursued. We see a uh, an agent played by Devante... Trevante Rhodes. Tra sorry, Trevante... <laughs> Say his name again. Trevante Rhodes. You know what I was thinking? Devante Swing from Joe to see him. <laughs> Sorry. D. Vane Shrimp. The guy from Moonlight. That's how I know him. And Bird Box. Oh, I don't remember. You know how... I remember Mac Miller from Bird Box. He's the one that... Not Mac Miller. Uh, who's engaged to a... Fuck. I can't remember. What? Who's the tall guy I saw at uh, Paramount? Sony. Machine Gun Kelly? Machine Gun Kelly. Is he in Bird Box? I don't. I. He's in Bird Box. Trevante Rhodes is the one that ends up with Sandra Bullock in that film. You know what? This is a mess, but so is this movie. So, um, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, Trevante plays uh, Jimmy Fletcher, an FBI agent, one of the first black FBI agents. He says, mm -hmm. um, and he is sort of used as a pawn to take down. Holiday by basically getting her charge like with drug charges, which results in her she's charged, found guilty, and serves a year in and prison. A, a year and a day. A year and a day. Lady Day. When she returns, uh, her cabaret license has been revoked, so she cannot perform in the typical venues she's used to in New York. <clears throat> um, but she finds ways around it. She goes on tour. She ends up getting having like an affair with this FBI agent mm -hmm. because. We see him in the beginning saying that he's just doing what's right and he wants to like get rid of drugs on the street, but through his mother's influence, through seeing uh, other people's reactions to what happened, he realizes that he's just a pawn and that we should be applauding an artist like Billie Holiday for not being afraid to speak up. So in his way, he tries to help her by warning her. She still ends up getting in trouble and getting arrested a couple of times. <laughs> Yeah, but she's framed. Um, but he, he provides testimony, uh, Jimmy Fletcher provides testimony that gets her off. And after that, it's kind of smooth sailing. However, because her drug addiction is um, destroying her, she is not at her prime and obviously dies at the age of 44. So she was a wreck. Um, that's cir it. Cirrhosis. From cirrhosis. But that's it. Huh. <sighs> Yeah, that's a very condensed, uh, an abridged synopsis of this film, which is over two hours. Yes. Uh, would Where you like to, to begin? start? Okay. Do you, uh, do you want to just go through my notes? Or do you, want to, do you have something to say immediately? No, go ahead. Well, first off, I knew this movie was, we were in trouble when we saw, we see Leslie Jordan, <laughs> who is wearing like an Amadeus wig. My note on Leslie, uh -huh. Leslie's looks. Margaret Rutherford, and you can look up who that is. I'll post a picture. <laughs> he looked like Margaret Rutherford from Black Spirit. Goodness. It was comical. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of this movie, to me, was unintentionally funny, which is not good. Yes, unfortunately. It, it feels uh, like a television film, not 
above a lifetime production at some point. No. The casting is interesting. Um, Evan Ross plays a colleague of Jimmy Fletcher's, Travante's character. And he looks like a teenage boy. Mm -hmm. um, that was very distracting to me. I agree. We also have Ms. Lawrence from The Real Housewives of Atlanta playing a... A very effeminate man who is like a confidant to Billy Holiday, mm -hmm. and I will say um, later on I'm going to talk about how some of the acting was crunchy. But I think Miss Lawrence is who is credited as Miss Lawrence uh, is actually performing. He's on the better end of things, sure. But I thought he um, I thought he looked like Monet Exchange, <laughs> the drag queen. Also, uh, the opening of the film when Billy Holiday is being interviewed by Leslie Jordan's character, um, we see. Ms. Lawrence's character. Aged. Aged. So Ms. Lawrence is buzzed. Like his head, like he's like balding like you are. So, well actually no. He's probably, his hairline is probably closer to mine I think. Okay. So when we see him playing bald, all they do is have him with a buzzed head. You can still see his hairline. And then they glue hair to the sides. That was terrible. It's terrible. It's still not as bad as what they did to Forrest Whitaker and Burden, but... <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, okay, so the, so, I don't even know where to begin. This film is so interesting to me because this, I said right after we were done that I, this movie felt like it was made by someone who doesn't adore Billie Holiday. Which kind of just wanted to exploit the fact that she was like a drug addict. And to me, this film is like, you know there's going to be another Whitney uh, biopic for Lifetime in like 10 years. And if they did that. So Whitney biopic on Lifetime, 10 years from now, and they just want to focus on her being a drug addict. Sure. Uh, and they bypass her like relevance and what she meant to people. Sure. But I can't imagine that someone like Lee Daniels has anything but reverence for Billie Holiday. Why? I mean... That he would want to make this film about her and, and also kind of develop the queer elements that, uh, at least in Lady Sings the Blues, were left out completely. I mean, I'm only familiar with, you know, I'm sure if I research, I will see many people think that his depictions of black women are problematic. And I'm just thinking of like Cookie and Empire and like Precious. And I know people have opinions about that. I'm not going there right now, except to say that I think he, it, this film just seems messy. Like the overall, like the main thing I took away, if you don't know who Billie Holiday is, the main thing you will take away from this film is that she was a drug addict. Yeah. But not in like a... Like the sort of like painful, like, oh, it's a disease and she couldn't mm -hmm. fight it. It's kind of comical. Because there are a couple of scenes where we see her using that almost have like a vaudeville type feel to them. Sure. Like sure. it's funny. Well, I think it's, <clears throat> and we were discussing this as we were watching it. I, I think it's because the tone feels off. It's not that the, the, it's not that they don't hit the period of the late 40s per se. I, I, I think it, everything is presented in a way that's totally awkward where the emphasis is incorrect. Right. I think. Where where some of the, like Divine Joy Randolph as Rosalind with her eye patch. Well uh, her with the Everybody Hates Chris gentleman. Oh yeah, uh, uh, what's his name? Tyler. I wrote down that they look like um, Tyler James Williams. Yeah, those those characters Rosalind and Lester look like cartoon villains. They do. They're almost a little bit Boris and Natasha. Yes, almost. that's what I wanted to say. They there are scenes where because they're especially uh, Lester's character. Well, Rosalind has an eye patch, so she already resembles that uh, Natasha character. But Lester's Lester, he's like mean mugging Billy in some shots. Yeah, and yeah. it's like what what are we doing here? <laughs> Yes, and I, and I think it's just that we're we're focusing on the wrong things in a lot of those sequences. Speaking of tone, uh, there's a scene where Billy's dog dies. Yes, and we see them at this like m like funeral kind mm -hmm. of like it's in the church, so that's not a funeral, like a service mm -hmm. for the dead uh, creature. But we don't know that it's a dog, so these people. They show a picture of the dog. We do, but initially we just see Billy like go, uh, crying hysterically. And mm -hmm. we assume that it's a family member because they say that. Mm -hmm. And then we see the picture of the dog. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and then you got Rosalind there with her eye patch crying. And it's just... About how you can't give the dog human food. Um, yes, it, and again, I think that's a good example of where you, you get kind of taken out of the plight of it. Then, and, oh, sorry. And there's so much focus on strange fruit, uh, which... 
it, this almost, it, it feels like the best angle to uh, approach Billy is what they're trying to do. But it should have been, I think, uh, about the song. I think more than a yeah, show. Yeah, we it's just all about this song, but then we don't really hear the origin of like the song itself and why she chose to sing it. Mm -hmm. Like it, it just like she says, I'm singing this song and it's about this thing. She explains it right in the beginning that it's about lynching and she says to another character because several people say to her, Stop singing the song and your problems will go away. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, Well, have you ever seen a lynching? And that's it. Like, she doesn't say she has. We assume she has. But then there's a scene where Billy gets off a tour bus in the middle of nowhere to pee, which starts off kind of comical when she hears, like, noises and walks through the cornfield, like, ten paces. Mm -hmm. And we see a man having been lynched with, like, a cross burning. And that scene should have been much more effective, but in, in, in a more sort of a mournful and horrific way. But instead, it read kind of... Uh, the exploitive. Yeah, it didn't hit the way I think it should have. However, after we witnessed her, or after we witnessed the lynching, then Billy, along with J Jimmy, because during this scene, we also see them using heroin. So it's like a dream sequence. I feel like that's the only part of the film that I think the tone made sense to me of what maybe Lee Daniels was trying to do. But uh, it just... On the whole, it feels like a mess. Sure. Yeah. Um, there's a, a method used of like intertwining vintage looking video footage and imagery, like graphics, with the um, like the feature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I thought that had the tone been different, it would have worked very well. Well, they used kind of like montages to skip ahead in time a bit. Yes, but I think because the film feels so like off that mm -hmm. just that added thing that kind of is unique just makes it feel even more off to me sure okay sure yeah i, I agree with that it, it 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 kind of just added to the overall cheapness of it kind of like once something is off all you can help but notice is sure. everything um, you commented on the language feeling modern and i think that these characters may have spoken this way back then however because the tone is off it just feels weird like there are just so many scenes, particularly when the gang is together, like mm -hmm. Roslyn, Lester, Billy, um, Ms. Lawrence, and they're kind of kikiing, and it it just feels kind of comical. It still feels like an SNL skit to me at times, like the, because we're you know oscillating in between those kind of things, and then um, Lady Day's uh, penchant for men as well, and uh, very abusive ones at that. Uh, that she also has no problem. Hitting, which also I think that the tone feels a little bit off, and we should be coming over, like she gets kicked in the face yeah. in one scene, which I did recoil, but I still don't think it had the gravitas that it should. Uh, I have many quotes written down that I just think are funny, like let's dump these snow bunnies and get into some black shit, and then <laughs> there's a sequence where we see Billy as a young girl, and apparently her mother was a prostitute. She worked in a bordello. Worked in a bordello, <clears throat> and then it appears Billy's like, what, 10 or 11, mm -hmm. when her mom says like, okay, now it's time for you to work as a prostitute, and then Billy's character says, I don't want to be an effing whore. Like, but the acting of the, like it all, the writing, the acting for many things felt crunchy to be. I, I think that that world is hard to depict as well because even like I'm a fan of Louis Maul's Pretty Baby with Susan Tran and Brooke Shields but even there are moments in that film when we're talking about sexuality that it, I don't know if it's just the English language or uh, well, what about the Richard Pryor movie where we, it's like semi-autobiographical is it Jojo Dancer? Jojo Dancer. Where we your see, life I mean, is calling. Yeah your life is calling where he like his mom some sure, sort of situation. Sure. And that was much more effective and still had humor to it. Sure. So this just was not... Yeah, uh, I'm not saying it's not possible. I right. just think that there's a propensity in the English language where sexuality... It, it's very hard to come across without making us want to laugh or be uncomfortable in the wrong ways. The acting I found most crunchy was the, the FBI agent um, Anslinger. Oh, who's yeah. played by... Garrett Hedlund, yeah. And I know it's difficult, like, I'm sure as a white actor playing someone who's clearly racist and having to say these words and act this way, 
but it's not fiction. Like there, like these people exist, and so it just feels kind of like he's playing someone who's hateful. There's no interiority. Also. Yeah, like man, you know what racism is. Like you could have dug in deep. You didn't have to go that far back in your uh, family to get some real racism. I'm sure. So I feel like he wasn't pulling from anything. He's just being like a dick. Yes. They're, yeah. They're all. All of those characters are very cookie cutter seeming. Which not that I need to see that either. Like I, I really could care less about his interiority. But but also it just comes across as over the top. As well. So Trevante, the FBI agent who initially sets up Billie Holiday, now he's sort of been tasked with following her to like set her up again. Mm -hmm. And that was so, the film doesn't explain why it would make sense to have, if, if I know like law enforcement is after me, shouldn't it be like a more covert thing? But it's very obvious that this agent is following her. And there's one, Ms. Lawrence's character says like, um, why is this black ass, why does this black ass federal agent keep following us? And it's like, it, it just didn't make sense to me. From a law enforcement perspective? Right. And, you know, perhaps that is what happened. I mean, I know, I'm know i sure that is what happened, but the way it plays out just seems, like, kind of cartoonish. Well, again, I think that's why period is off, because we should... I, I think we need to be interpreting that as she's uh, the f famous, uh, a black woman, and they can railroad her as easily as they, they can. They, sure. They, it, it, it's not going to take much. So I doubt that her or a lawyer representing her is claiming that the same officers harassing her would have had any kind of impact in the sure, late 1940s. Sure. But it doesn't convey that that is an actual fear either. There's a scene where Billy, because she's on tour and the FBI agent, uh, Jimmy is like traveling with her and they're like doing drugs, having sex, all that. And there's a scene where he goes out because she knows he's calling his boss to give him updates on Billy. So she's upset, but then she wants him to have sex with her. So she kind of gets like on all fours and then they start, but then Jimmy wants to like make love. Mm -hmm. That was very awkward. And I kind of felt bad because poor Andre Day had to like do these nude scenes and be shown having sex on screen. And it's not, it, it's not effective. Like I feel like she wasted her nudity on, on this sex scene. Sure, if that's still a viewpoint, I mean, why not have nude scenes? But, no, I'm um, sure she but, was yeah. comfortable, but it just seems like... for Because I think the highlight of this film is Andre Day's performance. Although it does play more like... I mean, she plays more like Ratchet Crackhead than like this... Like, I think the, the, the sort of... Uh, What's so amazing about Billie, about Billie Holiday is the duality in her image versus her struggle with drugs and her, and then balancing that with being a woman of color. In the 1930s, 40s, 40s and 50s. Like, that's so amazing. But then in this film, she just is like this, yeah, just sort of like ratchet ass lady who can't stop using heroin and likes to fight men. And, it, and then we get a little taste of her being... Um, like involved with Tallulah Bankhead, yeah, which I am fascinated by the idea that they were lovers. Um, and Tallulah's, of course, played by Natasha Lyonne, uh, who I really like. Who I, I really like, and I do feel that's I don't want to say it's underutilized because it shouldn't be a real focal point in the story, perhaps, but um, yeah, there's another scene, um, where Billy, and this is like in the later part of the 50s, she gets on a talk show, yeah, that was odd. And that was the strangest, I don't know who, like what talk show they were referencing, but that was super awkward and didn't make sense to me. Well, because of what, it, there's no context and it's kind of odd what happens yeah. on that. Then there's one scene where Billy's hair is obviously like painted on. Mm -hmm. It looks like a really bad synthetic wig that's pulled into like a bun. So it's like super obvious and immediately I knew that there was a reason for that. So I was thinking, oh, maybe it's to show that like because of her health issues, her hair was falling out. And we even see her like applying like shoe polish to her hair to make it look darker. And then it's just one scene and that's it. After that, like as time progresses, her hair looks fine again. Right, yeah. That really threw me off. Also her teeth at a point are adjusted to look like they're in poor condition, mm -hmm. which I also thought looked kind of crazy. Well, yeah, because we see that scene in 54 with the shellacked hair, but the teeth look But the fine. teeth are fine. And then the next... But then when the teeth are bad, her hair's fine. Yeah. 
I know that's a little thing, but I think in combination with just sort of again, I think it's jumbled because nature because the thing. emphasis is wrong on things. We are drawn to automatically noticing things. I think we would have we would have been um, projected into this universe instead of looking at everything that might be a little off. Well, I feel bad because I didn't want to not like this film, but it did feel tedious. It did feel like you said, like a lifetime movie, which I generally like, but then like. I just expected more, so I think I'm disappointed because I expected more. I had high expectations because when you approach a subject like Billie Holiday, automatically, uh, and then you have this notable singer playing her, uh, and then a return to narrative filmmaker for Lee Daniels, who hasn't done a what was meant to be a theatrical release since Lee Daniels' The Butler in 2013. And, you know, his films always have a kind... I don't want to say trashy but kind of pulp quality to them that I really dig. I really liked The Paperboy. I think it was a lot of fun. Um, was that guy Fran gets peed on? By Nicole Kidman oh. to ameliorate a jellyfish burn. That's why um, you like it, but okay. There are lots of you. Matthew McConaughey. Uh, Shadowboxer. Shadowboxer is fucking crazy. Uh, Helen Mirren and Cuba Gooding Jr. as assassin lovers, mother and stepson. Uh, and then... Monique and as a crackhead nurse and Joseph Gordon-Levitt as a crackhead do doctor that are also lovers. Macy Gray, that movie's insane. But but again, the taste level of it is, of course, not quite there, but it's a lot of fun. Um, so this, you know, unfortunately bears the marks of that. And we can't not talk a little bit about Lady Sink the Blues. Well, you have a few minutes, so you can talk a little bit about it. Well, I, I love Lady Sings the Blues. Yeah, it's a great um, movie. And to, to correct a minor wrong when we did our Criterion um, review of Claudine, and I had said uh, Diane Carroll was the second uh, black woman nom for, nominated for Best Actress, I completely, and I do this often, blink out on Diana Ross being nominated for Lady Sings the Blues because in my mind I can't believe that she didn't win the Oscar for that. And if... You know, Barbara Streisand and Katherine Hepburn tied one year for Best Actress, and that's the only time that's ever happened. If there were any year to tie two people, it would have been Liza Minnelli for Cabaret and um, Diana Ross for Lady Sings the Blues. Completely different mood uh, in that film. It has one of the best opening credit sequences of any film ever. Uh, I firmly believe. Sure, but I don't think it's fair to compare these two because that's not it's what... It's not about comparing them, know. but I mean, you have a major actress, Diana Ross, playing... Billie Holiday, and you know we're we're revisiting this uh, icon now, um, you, and you know they they want us to court these comparisons. I think why would you have Evan Ross in this throwaway role? I, I think Travante was styled to look like Billy Dee Billy Williams, D, yeah. even though the character that Billy Dee Williams plays in Lady Sings the Blue, Louis McKay, is played by Rob Morgan uh, in this film. So there are. They're, they're asked, for those, if you know about it, you're going to make those comparisons. But I don't think it stands up to it. But there are things, again, that I did like about it. I liked Andre Day. Um, Lastly, I want to mention the music. Um, the music's beautifully done. You mean the score? No, the actual singing by Andre Day. Yeah. But there's so much of it. There's so much of it. I know that sounds weird, but it's like sometimes I felt like it was unrelenting. And I wish that instead of having these musical sequences... Like, just tell more of the story. Like, let's just dig into her as a person. And because there, I mean, I should have counted how many songs, but there are at least, what, six or seven, like, stage performance, like, where she's singing on stage. Yeah. And very little's happening beyond us watching her sing. And again, sounds beautiful, looks beautiful. Oh, yeah. I mean, and if you like Billie Holiday hearing her music, yeah, you're going to dig all of it. And actually, I would watch Andre Day do, like, a 90 minute concert as Billie Holiday. Like, I'll stream that. Concert. I mean, the scene where we actually do get her singing uh, in close-up Strange Fruit, I did like. Yeah. I think that's effective. What would you give this film? Uh, unfortunately, uh, and we didn't mention the book that it's based on by Johan Hari was uh, adapted by uh, Suzanne Laurie Parks, who her first screenplay was Girl 6 for Spike Lee. Okay. Uh, but she's also adapted Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, uh, a contemporization of Native Son recently. Um, I would give this film two out of five stars. I would give it two out of five as well. Thank you. Bye.